Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Tona Odom land. And as a visitor, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. My presentation revolves around the politics of the same kind of acknowledgement that I've just made, uh, only this time in contemporary Australia. The map here is meant to give you a sense of the diversity of Aboriginal peoples on that continent, many of whom are multilingual. There's a more interactive version of this map uh, with much greater resolution <laughs> available at the website there at the bottom, and I would recommend having a longer look at that when you get a chance. I'm talking today about Kim Scott's award-winning 2010 novel, That Dead Man Dance, which takes place in Noongar country of present-day Western Australia. As you can see, the term Noongar refers to a broader collective of many distinct subgroups in the way that Anishinaabe and Pueblo do in Native North America. The encircled area here depicts the novel's specific setting and the author's home, which is present-day Albany. That Dead Man Dance resists the linear chronology of the typical plot summary. Most of the action takes place between 1826 and 1844, though this period is divided into a prologue and four other non-consecutive parts in the novel. Further disrupting a linear, a linear chronology, scenes from protagonist Bobby Wallamagini's later life intersperse the entire text, regardless of the novel's parts so that the novel develops events contemporaneously in a given year, say 1836, but also in Elder Bobby's present time, the exact year of which is never stated. Bobby is a storyteller, and Dead Man is his story in so much as, as it is the story of the place that formed him and how Anglo settlement gradually changed his home. Noongar and British settlers peacefully cohabitate for much of the novel with some characters even forming intimate bonds of friend and kinship. Won Yeren and Dr. Cross form the strongest of these cross-cultural relationships, though both men meet untimely deaths because of a pervasive illness that significantly reduces the Noongar population. The two men are buried together, a symbolic representation of the novel's central arguments that, one, Aboriginal and arrival populations could have lived together in harmony, and two, that Anglo-Australian colonization was not an inevitability, but a deliberate process. Bobby embodies the possibility of syncretism that exists between the two cultures that he uses language to mediate. Other forces are at work, however, and King Georgetown's expansion from temporary military garrison to permanent settlement hastens the deterioration of indigenous settler relationships. Jordy Cheney and his employees play a central role in this process, as the unscrupulous Cheney amasses more and more capital through smuggling, over-harvesting of the whale population, and even arranging his daughter's marriage to a politically powerful suitor. He's aided in many of these endeavors by Skelly, a former convict and master craftsman who harbors deep resentment toward the Noongar people, increasingly exploiting the power he derives as Cheney's employee to enact a litany of physical, sexual, and emotional abuses. Bobby remains hopeful throughout the novel that the settlers will honor Noongar sovereignty and their cultural protocols for reciprocity, particularly sharing resources after settler capitalism has disrupted Noongar foodways. Bobby makes the final plea to Cheney and company in one of his trademark elaborate performances, only to be shunned by those whom he assumed to be his friends and extended family. His despair over having failed for the first time as a storyteller is compounded when, in the novel's closing sentences, it's implied that the police shoot the two of the remaining Noongar elders still active in the novel, Minnick and Manic. My reading of that Dead Men Dance suggests that the novel must be understood in the political and cultural context during which it was produced, the first decade of the 21st century, and not only those in which it is set, the early to mid 19th century. This marks a departure from previous readings that treat Dead Man as a historical novel, and more specifically, a post-colonial contact novel. Instead, my analysis recenters elements of Noongar cultural sovereignty evident throughout the text, particularly in scenes depicting hospitality protocol, welcoming rituals, and makarata, a Yongu word describing the process for finding just resolutions to disputes through truth-telling and adherence to traditional law. 
In order to perform, to perform this analysis, I need to first provide an overview of contemporary Aboriginal and settler political relations in Australia. The advent of Australia's reconciliation agenda in the early 1990s coincides with what has been termed the history wars, which is not that unlike the so-called culture wars that occurred uh, during the same period in the US. Essentially, the history wars refer to conservative backlash towards multiculturalism and the political left's growing tendency to speak more openly about colonial violence against indigenous people. Those supporting the movement toward reconciliation between settler and Aboriginal Australians were often derided for having taken a black arm view band of history, or sorry, a black arm band view of history, to which progressives countered by accusing conservatives of wearing a white blindfold when looking at national history. Uh, writers soon began to take up the question of whether contemporary white Australian citizens should mourn or celebrate their country's past. Within a decade, there were enough reconciliation-themed creative works to suggest a new literary movement amongst Australian writers, as evidenced by the two critical monographs shown here. Uh, there's a longer discussion to be had about differences between settler-authored and indigenous-authored reconciliation narratives, what motivates them, what they accomplish, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to save that for later talks. Reconciliation and or recognition initiatives have occurred in the U.S. and Canada during the same period, and as in Canada and the U.S., Australian reconciliation follows official policies of extermination and assimilation. Australian reconciliation is unique in that the federal government has recognized native title land claims, offered an official apology for child removal practices, and pursued constitutional reform to recognize the legal rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Often framed as progressive developments that celebrate Australia's cultural diversity, these reconciliatory or conciliatory gestures have also come under criticism as examples of liberal multiculturalism that subverts claims to indigenous sovereignty and legitimizes settler state dominance. Uh, so I'm providing this timeline not to inundate you with information, but to give you a sense of the rate at which major legal and social developments occurred, particularly throughout the 1990s. And you might prefer instead uh, to look at the timeline on the back of your handout uh, instead of following along here. The major points to note are the two high court rulings, which not only acknowledge native title, uh, officially disavowing the discovery doctrine of terra nullius, but in the case of Wick, ruled that native title and pastoral leases for agricultural production could coexist. Uh, the 1997 Bringing Them Home report addressed the traumatic experiences of members of the stolen generations, those children who were officially removed and placed in boarding schools, um, and that uh, publication led to the inauguration of a National Sorry Day the following year. By contrast, notice the rate at which significant developments slow down in the 2000s. Now I suspect this is partly related to two events that happened in 2001. The first being what is now called the Tampa Affair, in which several hundred refugees, mostly from Arab countries, arrived in Australian international waters and demanded asylum, and the second, of course, being uh, what we call 9-11 now, which dominated global politics for much of a decade. This suggests to me the persistence of a certain misnomer in settler nations, that indigenous issues are separate from and perhaps less important than issues of national security, international diplomacy, and immigration regulation. It's important to also note that from 1996 to 2007, conservative John Howard served as prime minister and either stymied or walked back some of the more progressive measures of the reconciliation agenda. For instance, the Yorta Yorta ruling determined that Aboriginal people's claim to native title can be extinguished if the observance of traditional laws and customs of that country are substantially interrupted. And that's precisely what settler colonialism does. Welcome to Country and the closely related Acknowledgement of Country rituals refer to a recent phenomenon in Australian settler society of ceremonially acknowledging traditional ownership of colonized lands. The primary distinction between welcome and acknowledgement rituals involve the speaker, 
Welcomes can only be performed by recognized elders of the representative Aboriginal peoples associated with the country upon which those events are taking place. While acknowledgments can be performed by any non-Indigenous person or by an Aboriginal person not from that particular country. These related rituals gained widespread acceptance as part of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's reconciliation agenda, which included his much more discussed formal apology to members of the Stolen Generations in 2008. As with apology, scholars working in Aboriginal and Australian studies debate the degree to which welcome and acknowledgement ceremonies engender tokenistic representations of Aboriginality under the guise of liberal multiculturalism. Anthropologist Christina Everett has written about one of the more outrageous instances of such tokenism in which the Darug people of Western Sydney have been routinely invited to deliver welcome to country speeches, speeches even after their native title claims have been dismissed by the courts. Without directly stating as such, these invitations imply that indigenous sovereignty is a symbolic superficiality allowed to exist within the structures of state rule. Despite their disagreements, scholars acknowledge that Aboriginal elders often accept welcome to country invitations as a means of formally stating opposition to the state's claim to place. Curtis Roman states that he very rarely agrees to deliver welcome speeches because of their conciliatory nature, though he adds, quote, welcome to country should be seen as an opportunity to take some leadership and say something that can be, or that can make a positive difference, something that educates and initiates reflection. Those of us working in indigenous studies in native North America might think of such counterclaims in relation to what Kevin Bruniel calls the third space of sovereignty, which he contends, quote, acknowledges the colonial imposition of boundaries on indigenous political subjects, while also showing how this location on the boundaries is the site of practices that challenge colonial rule. So in that spirit, my framing of that dead man dance isn't meant to suggest that moments of contact, uh, contact are not critically important to the history of settler indigenous relations. Rather, I would suggest that Scott's novel makes legible the important distinction that indigenous sovereignties existed well before and persist long after the arrival of settler colonizers. Um, as, a, as a quick aside, you might have noticed in one of the earlier, I don't know if you can see it from that far away, um, but in the American version, uh, or the American printing of the novel, Linda Hogan blurbs, uh, it's saying, never has a first contact story been so true and powerful. And we all know the nature of blurbs, but uh, I'm certainly not gonna stand here with a copy of Mean Spirit in my bag uh, and going to Oklahoma to give this talk and say that Linda Hogan is not right about this being a contact narrative. Rather, I read her endorsement of Scott's novel as being more true and powerful to be a gesture of the shortcomings of first contact stories uh, and that I'm thinking of here, right? How they inherently privilege the arrival of settlers as the origin point for temporal narrative and social ordering that normalizes boundaries between settlers and indigenous peoples. Um, so adapting this concept of welcoming as a critical lens for dead man rather than contact does not magically solve the problematic power dynamics of settler dominance. It might even appear to merely repackage them, giving the conciliatory politics of welcome to country rituals. To avoid doing so, I suggest that the hospitality protocol described in Scott's novel be understood first in terms of Aboriginal sovereignty, and secondly, in relation to the concept of Makarata, rather than the federal government's reconciliation platforms. From the very beginning of that dead man dance, Scott unsettles the primacy of Anglo arrival and first contact. The prologue is set in the most recent time during which the novel takes place, with Bobby already advanced in age and living alone on the beach in a meager dwelling. The section opens with Bobby speaking one word, Kaya, which readers quickly learn translates to hello or yes in his traditional Noongar language. Already, the novel has disrupted the linear chronology of settler centrality that typifies contact scenes, as the first contact to take place in the novel occurs between the reader and Bobby, who offers us a traditional greeting, a welcome of sorts. The first contact between the novel's Noongar and Anglo characters also takes place in the prologue, though it too subverts the collision of cultures motif generally associated with such narratives. 
basic elements of the scene might not initially seem too dissimilar from the conventions of a more traditional contact novel, though. As readers witness an encounter between an aborigine and an Anglo character meeting on a beach, the first frontier that existed between indigenous and settler peoples. And there are certainly elements of intrusion and potential violence underlying their exchange. Bobby's been sitting alone upon the beach, writing short phrases to himself on a piece of slate. Cheney arrives unannounced, but for the heavy tread of his steps, and he, quote, thrusts himself into the little hut, uninvited. Bobby immediately notices that there is, quote, hardly space for the two of them beneath this roof, and that if Conk breathes then deep, stands up straight, the shelter will explode. This contact scene also registers a number of marked differences between the two men. Cheney embodies excess in wealth and habit. He exudes the smell of rum and cigars and in physicality. Bobby notes that Cheney hasn't just overcrowded the small space with his size. He also, quote, steams with rain and body heat and ruddy health. He is seemingly overrun in bodily surplus to the point that, quote, water cascades over the brim of his hat and gushes from his bristling beard. Bobby, on the other hand, can, quote, feel the cold seeping into his bones, which lie under his loose and wrinkled skin. The stark difference between the two men's bodies foreshadows Settler Cheney's capitalist accumulation and Bobby's loss of traditional culture, though readers will be unaware of these developments until much later in the novel. Here, they merely appear to have a slightly uncomfortable intimacy between them. It might be tempting, then, to read the contrast between Cheney and Bobby as evidence of the novel having fallen into one of the worst traps of the contact form, the binary of savagism and civilization. But even as Cheney disrupts Bobby's world, this isn't a collision between men who consider themselves enemies, nor is it their first meeting. Readers learn in a later chapter that the title Konk refers to a special uncle, meaning that even though Cheney is a wealthy settler, Bobby regards him with some degree of familial respect and even adoration. Bobby does appear diminished by comparison, bereft of basic comforts and with his body breaking down where Cheney's exudes vitality. But Bobby is not the vanishing native we've become familiar with through other contact narratives, such as Fenimore Cooper's The Leatherstocking Tales, which shows up twice in this book. In fact, he has an incredible generative power that manifests itself through his use of language. Quote, life tingled in his very fingertips, the narrator tells us. Bobby keeps watch on the horizon while Cheney blusters about, crumbling, farting, and telling his host that he ought to build a fire. He's not a very good house guest. <laughs> he leaves on account of not having seen any whales spouting. And Bobby narrates Cheney's leave taking on his piece of slate writing, Conk gone, whales come. Mm -hmm. No sooner than he's written these words, Bobby sees them come to fruition. His inexorable strength as a storyteller is on full display here as the prologue comes to a close with these words. Bobby wrote and made it happen again and again in seasons to come, starting just now, here, Kaya. Here, Kaya seems to have a dual function, with Bobby perhaps greeting the returning whales in the same way in which he greeted readers, but also affirming that yes, Bobby has recorded an event that will be encountered by readers for generations to come. In this regard, Bobby's language skills also serve to affirm the continuation of Noongar culture, as does Scott's novel. Indeed, Scott incorporates Noongar protocol throughout Dead Man, a technique especially evident in passages in which non-indigenous characters are welcomed to Noongar country. The charismatic Wunyeren routinely mediates between Noongar and British arrivants, acting both as a diplomat and a negotiator. Perhaps the most notable scene in which he performs these duties occurs when he trains his new friend, Dr. Cross, to meet Manic in the proper way. The narration describes Wunyeren as playfully maneuvering Cross toward the elder Noongar man, who, quote, held out his hand across the shrinking space between them. Cross grasped it, and Minnick immediately pulled him into an embrace. He then lifted him from the ground, and with his arms around Cross's waist, turned in a full circle. Eyeball to eyeball, one man in a cloak of an animal skin, a hair belt, and with mud and grease smeared over his skin, the other with only the flesh of his face and hands exposed. Minnick released him and stepped back. A, booming, a beaming Wunyeren gestured for Cross to remove his jacket, then he unclasped Minnick's cloak and slid it from his shoulders. He handed each man the other's attire. Mm -hmm. 
The novel has, by this point, established that the particular form of embrace and ceremonial exchange of clothing are customary practices amongst the Noongar people. In this instance, readers experience the ritual from the Englishman's point of view. The surprising, this is a quote, surprisingly soft and pliable kangaroo skin hung easily from across his shoulders, enclosing him in the smell of another man. A very different man, of course, but a man for all of that. Noongar, he remembered. The scent was not so much that of a body, but of sap and earth, the oils and ochres, and who knew what else of this land. When Yearn and Cross demonstrate their mutual potential for cross-cultural understanding here, both in the ways in which Wun Yearn facilitates the meeting and the way in which Cross's participation in the intimate ritual reminds him of their shared humanity. In other words, the first meeting between Minnick and Cross is not so much about profound difference or cultural collision as it is about a recognition of shared humanity and the potential for cross-cultural exchange. The details with which Scott describes this scene further suggests that what readers experience here is not merely contact between two different cultures, but the observance of proper welcoming protocol through an interpersonal Noongar ritual that involves reciprocity. When Yaren's role in the formal introductions affirms his important standing amongst the Noongar people, as only certain members are qualified to carry out a mediator's obligations. Together, when Yaren and Menek are also affirming their claim to belonging, as the ritual is not only meant to introduce Cross to an important member of this Noongar group, but also as a means of negotiating a relationship between the visitor Cross and the country. The exchange of clothing suggests that Wunyaren and Minnick are extending hospitality to Cross by offering him a form of protection from the country to which they intimately belong. Francesca Merlin explains that from a local indigenous point of view, introductions are protective not simply welcoming in the ordinary understanding of the word as kindly reception or greeting. There's a pervasive indigenous sensibility that the living country may present dangers to people unknown to it and whose being is not intimately involved with it. Therefore, practices like garment exchange, as well as a local's addresses to ancestral beings announcing who has come to visit are understood to reduce that element of foreignness that might attract harm. Merlin further notes that, quote, people who perform these kinds of acts assume that the country and its living forces are sensitive to smell, that locals and non-locals can be distinguished, and that olfactory difference between them can be reduced by these small acts. Cross first notices the feel of the kangaroo cloak, yes, but the smells associated with it are more poignant, a scent that is richly layered with elements of country, of sap and earth, of oils and ochres. Thus, when Yaren and Menik extend hospitality and protection to their guests, and in the process, affirm their inherent right to do so as hosts on these lands. Much of this cross-cultural goodwill will have been undone by the novel's tragic conclusion. When Yaren and Cross both succumb to illness, and while their shared burial site initially signifies the bonds they work to establish in their lifetimes, the grave's eventual desecration by town planners symbolizes the breaking of those bonds as the greed of men like Cheney spurs on the settlement's progress. Settlers' unwillingness to honor Noongar protocols for reciprocity compounds the unrest developing around Cheney's institutionalization of market capitalism through resource exhaustion and labor exploitation. Foodways have been disrupted by overpopulation and overhunting, and when Bobby, Minnick, and their countrymen are denied a share of settler sheep and imported goods to which they are entitled by traditional protocol, the Noongar begin taking food without Cheney's permission. Bobby is eventually jailed for these offenses, but during an informal trial, he reveals having witnessed Cheney murder two Aboriginal servants indentured to the colony's governor. In exchange for a signed testimony that, unbeknownst to him, excuses Cheney for any wrongdoing, Bobby is granted a small audience with settlers for whom he performs what is essentially a makarata ceremony. Now, I borrow the term makarata from the Oluru Statement from the Heart, issued by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, de um, excuse me, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegates of the Referendum Council at the 2017 National Constitution Convention, uh, which was held at Oluru a sacred site for many Aboriginal Australians. In that statement, council delegates defined Makarata as, quote, the coming together after a struggle, 
More specifically, the term refers to ceremonial practices meant to end disputes and ensure that grudges do not persist into the future. Now, this can, but does not always, involve spearing a perpetrator or member of the offending group in the thigh. But that is the case with Skelly in the novel, and that's why he hates the Nungar. In the Oru statement, delegates call for the establishment of a Makarata commission to, quote, supervise a process of agreement making and truth telling about our history. Now, this differs from the majority of federal government's reconciliation measures, from native title legislation to welcome and acknowledgement of country rituals, in that Makarata insists on inherent aboriginal sovereignty and the right to negotiate outside the strictures of imperial rule brought to country via settler invasion. Makarata remakes reconciliation from a settler-centric process of recognition into a reciprocal process of renegotiation. Bobby clearly understands his performance toward the end of the novel in this sense, as he lightheartedly teases the doubting Minnick and Manic, saying, quote, hadn't he escaped the lockup from just a few words on paper? Child's play. What was that against dance and song? Intending to, quote, show them how people must live here together, Bobby gently scolds the settlers for their unwillingness to adapt to Noongar law. Narrating his own dance, he observes that, quote, some people come to live here and want to stay like they never moved away from their own place. He reminds them of the, quote, need to be inside the sound and spirit of the place to live here properly. And how can that be, he asks the settlers, without we people who have been here for all time? In his final address to the audience, he simultaneously reasserts his sovereign authority and the reciprocal nature of Noongar hospitality. This is my land, he states, given me by Konk Minnick. We will share it with you and share what you bring. Bobby's performance does the work of Makarata and that it affirms Aboriginal belonging, involves truth telling about wrongs that have been committed, and that's in contrast to the way in which the legal signed confession obscures the truth and it offers a peaceful resolution in order to restore harmony and moving forward. His performance proves unsuccessful as most of the audience leaves the meeting place without comment. As they make their departure, Bobby overhears the gunfire suggesting that Minnick and Manet have been shot in the book's final sentence. Bobby's profound sense of loss at the novel's conclusion transports readers back to the prologue explaining his bitterness and destitution, as well as the distance that exists between himself and Cheney later in life. Familiar genre conventions of historical novels suggest that the conclusion of Dead Man should be read as the story's inevitable outcome, thus aligning the novel within the conventions of Australia's archetypical contact narrative. Bobby's greeting to readers, Kaya, as well as the revelation that he has recorded King Georgetown's settlement's history in a journal challenges such readings. Despite all that has transpired, Bobby retains the power to welcome visitors to his ancestral country and the ability to translate his story into a medium that white audiences are more likely to understand than traditional song and dance. In this way, Bobby's story and Scott's novel are doing similar work to that of the many elders offering welcome to country speeches, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegates of the Referendum Council who met at Uluru in 2017. Each of these examples suggests that Aborigines' claim to belonging have not been extinguished by Australian settler colonialism, and that such claims do not originate from the authority of the settler government. Many of the themes found in works by Aboriginal Australians are also at play in the literatures of Native North America, and there are ample opportunities for relational research and coursework. In concluding this presentation, I'd like to discuss educational resources and potential courses that go beyond the scope of my specific research into Scott's novel. First, I want to draw your attention to the Oslet database the premier digital humanities exhibition and online resource for the study of Australia's literary traditions. During my Fulbright Fellowship in 2017, I interned for Auslit and developed an exhibition on Australian literature around settler colonialism, which includes an annotated bibliography of creative and scholarly works, a timeline of key events and publications, a glossary of critical terms, and units on themes and motifs for comparative analysis. 
Now, while this particular exhibition is geared towards teaching undergraduate students interested in relational analysis between the US and Australia, Austlet's special collection, Blackwords, is both comprehensive and detailed enough to support graduate level research on Abor Aboriginal Australian prose, poetry, film, and music. I'm still working with Austlet as a content developer and would eagerly pursue opportunities for collaboration with colleagues, graduate students, and affiliated programs interested in indigenous digital humanities. I prepared a few sample syllabi that demonstrate how I would develop specific courses on or integrate Aboriginal Australian text into courses offered uh, that also encompass Native North America. I'm particularly interested in offering a course that brings together indigenous scholarship on sovereignty and reconciliation with creative works by native artists in Australia, the US, and Canada. I'm thinking here of scholarship by Eileen Morton Robinson, Larissa Barrent, Audra Simpson, Jody Bird, Taiki Alford, and Glenn Cathard. I'm interested in how works like Laylee Long Soldier's poetry collection, Whereas, which responds to an overlooked piece of 2000, 2009 legislation formally apologizing to indigenous Americans, can be placed into conversation with Berendt's docu documentary, After the Apology, which chronicles four Aboriginal grandmothers struggle against child removal a decade after Rudd's apology to the stolen generations. Other creative works would include, in the US, Stephen Graham Jones' The Bird is Gone, from Australia, Kim Scott's most recent novel, Taboo, and from Canada, Tracy Lindbergh's Birdie, for the ways in which they frame issues of land rights around historical trauma in relation to the lived experiences of contemporary indigenous peoples. These works are particularly interesting because they imagine individual reconciliation through self-discovery and healing that take place within and outside the parameters of settler society. Once again, I thank you for being here this afternoon, and I'd like to open the conversation up now to any questions.